the moment that I'm going to start. So uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Kleinenberg. I am the director of the Institute for Public Knowledge at NYU. That's where you are right now. You probably don't realize that you're at the Institute for Public Knowledge, but welcome. Um, this is our virtual space. We are one of the um, uh, co-sponsors and hosts of the um, uh, uh, Future of Democracy program, uh, which uh, our featured speaker tonight, Beth Novick, has been directing. Uh, Beth, as you know, is also the director of the GovLab uh, at NYU. And uh, she is a woman uh, who, doing many things. And in, now, in addition to, to doing that, uh, she is uh, uh, at Northeastern uh, as a professor this year on leave from NYU. And she's directing the Burns Family Center for Social Change and Impact. And its partner project uh, is, uh, is, the Gov, is the Gov Lab. So she has both of those things going. Uh, Beth, it's somewhat awkward for me to be describing her formally because uh, Beth is a a colleague and also someone uh, I, I've gotten to know well as a friend these last several years in New York. She is a tremendous collaborator uh, and a, a fierce uh, social and political critic as well as just a great thinker. And one of the things uh, that I love about what Beth does is that Beth does things. Um, you, you probably have seen in her bio that she calls the GovLab uh, a do tank, a do tank. Sorry, not a, a do tank, not a think tank, a do tank. And I and I and I hope at some point tonight she's going to tell us what that's all about. But the context for our conversation, as you know, uh, is that she has just uh, published this book, "Solving Public Problems." Uh, it's out with Yale University Press. Uh, it is a an unusual book. It, it, it's a, a kind of a combination of an analytic book. Uh, that has uh, a, a, a kind of take on how to how to think more effectively, uh, how to do research more effectively, uh, how to define problems more effectively. But it's also a kind of a how-to book. It's a practical guide. Uh, it's a book not just for thinkers but for doers, and it genuinely walks that line in a way that you don't see very often. Um, and that's not a surprise to anyone who knows Beth or the GovLab or the Future of Democracy Project. Um, but it's, it's extraordinary to see it written in this way. And I believe that um, Sam, who uh, works with us at IPK and at the GovLab, has just shared with you links uh, to solving public problems uh, on, the, on the chat here. And for those of you who are veterans at the Institute for Public Knowledge, you know, like one of the things we love to do is to have the booksellers come to these events. And, you know, we typically offer all this, you know, great free food and drink and a gathering place. You remember gathering places where we used to come together physically and share space. So, so we do all that and we create an occasion and we, and we make sure that the bookseller at the end of the night walks home with, without carrying any books. And so we can't tell you that you're, you know, it's mandatory that you take a book home tonight, but you now have links uh, uh, both to the GovLab and also to the uh, site where you can purchase uh, solving public problems through Yale University Press. Um, the, the format for tonight is, um, uh, I, I, I've asked for Beth to, to tell us, you know, how this book came about, why now. Uh, you might share with me the um, notion that this is, in some ways, the best possible moment for a book that's a practical guide about um, how to fix our government and change the world with government, but maybe also a sense that in some ways, that seems like a very big ask, you know, to, to, to expect that government is going to solve um, routine problems, let alone things like how we get out of the pandemic and how we deal with climate change uh, and uh, racial injustice and the, the many other kind of overlapping crises we face at the moment. But Beth has published a book into this. Uh, and so I want to ask Beth to, to get us going in this conversation by, by discussing, you know, where this push comes from and why now. Um, but quickly, before we do that, a, a note on the format. Um, uh, I've asked Beth to speak for a little bit, then she and I are going to engage in conversation. And then I, we have a lot of extraordinary people I can see already who are joining us here uh, online. So uh, we will open it up to questions. You just have to write them into the chat uh, or um, uh, I, I guess the chat is the best way to do that tonight. Um, or possibly we could um, 
get some raised hands as well and bring people into the conversation if we can get the technology working. So you have either of those options, but probably writing writing a question is going to be the easiest way to do it. Um, so uh, we will wrap at six o'clock. And uh, with that, I think we have a good a good group here already. Um, and Beth, welcome to Virtual IPK. Congratulations on this really, really uh, uh, extraordinary book. And, and I wonder if you could get us going tonight by just telling us, you know, how did you come to, um, you know, how did you come to decide that uh, we really do have a chance to do things better, uh, you know, with government, that, that, that this is really a plausible project um, for the moment that we're in right now, and not, not just a plausible one, but a necessary one. Eric, thank you so much, if for no other reason than taking over the moderation duties for me tonight. I'm glad to get a break. It's very nice to see so many familiar names in the uh, attendee list and many new names, many people to whom I owe emails, I fear. Uh, um, but I'm delighted for the conversation that we're gonna have now. Uh, um, and in the chat, there is also the Q&A button. Uh, Any way you wanna reach us, uh, eager for your comments, your questions, and your reflections um, on this important moment. And it is an important moment, which is why I wanted to do this book now. I mean, as a practical matter, I wrote it now because COVID gave me the chance to write it and to finish a project that had been underway for many years, in fact. Um, but where we all, thanks to the lack of travel uh, and the moment that we were in, whether it's COVID, and the really acute challenge of the public health crisis that we've been facing, the associated economic crisis of unemployment, but ballooning unemployment and all the associated challenges, or frankly, the chronic problems that we have all been struggling with and will continue to struggle with, whether it's the existential threat of climate change, of racial injustice and inequity, generations long widening economic inequality, there are a lot of problems in the world that we need to tackle. And I think that it would be, I am not alone, let me say, in getting up, especially during the pandemic each day and listening to the news and listening to the news during the Trump administration that preceded and followed uh, uh, and just feeling like we need to do something more. And so that was the impetus for this book is to really answer the question, what more can we do? What more can we do both as institutions, but also as individuals to really address the challenges of our time. And so it would be easy, especially in light of all of these challenges and really the nadir of those challenges, if you will, on January 6th, when we really thought that the institutions that we have erected to address these challenges may be uh, you know, in, in crisis uh, and at their end, um, but at the very least ill-equipped to be able to respond to these challenges. Uh, I still approach this from the perspective, a very optimistic perspective, to say that the tools to solve our challenges, the tools, the methods, the approaches, now in the 21st century with the kinds of technological advances we've had, scientific advances and social scientific advances, and here I want to give a shout out to Eric and his work um, and his wonderful book, Palaces for the People, uh, which we'll say more about in the course of this conversation, but are really our understanding that comes in much part from your work of how to engage with and listen to communities, how to use data in new and exciting ways, how to combine these qualitative and quantitative approaches really gives us a playbook for how we can do things differently. And we saw that very much during COVID. You know, so I have the privilege, in addition to my academic work, to lead a team of technologists and designers and engineers and policy professionals in the Office of Innovation for the state of New Jersey. And look, there were many, many things that we did wrong or we didn't do enough of, but there were some really bright moments where, you know, we turned around and we partnered with a private sector tech company and the state's universities to be able to put up a COVID response site in three days and respond to the tide of disinformation and misinformation by providing a reliable source of information that's been used by something like 150 million people. The ability then to turn around and listen to residents and talk to seniors about their experience with vaccines and be able then to redesign 
to first to design and fail and then redesign a system for distributing vaccines to people to be able to do projects like um, we did with Federation of American Scientists, where we collaborated with a network of 600 scientists to be able to provide real time responses to people's questions about COVID. And there are countless examples like this from around the world of how governments, civil society organizations and individuals have done things right that I think we can learn from. And so it's inspired by examples like these and very much not you know, my own or those of my team, but people all around the world that we have talked to and work with and coach over the years. It's Samir Brahmachari in India, the head of, former head of Science India, who built a network of 8,000 students and scientists to crowdsource the, so the better drugs in response to tuberculosis and other uh, diseases that affect the poor where drug companies have not made progress in 40 years. And within the space of five years, they're in clinical trials on several new approaches to addressing tuberculosis. It's Jonathan Wachtel in the city of Lakewood, Colorado, the lone city planner in a community of 100, 150,000 people uh, who, you know, rather than put up his hands and say, there's nothing much I can do as one person about climate change, who leveraged a network of 20,000 residents to develop 500 different projects to address sustainability and climate change and has now spread that model to four different cities and has created a, net a network called the Sustainable Solutions Network. I could go on and on and on with these examples, but let me just summarize by say, what they give us is a playbook, a playbook for focusing on problems and for really learning what it means to define the problem that we're trying to solve regardless of politics and to laser beam our focus on what those problems are, to use data, especially the big data and the technologies of machine learning that allow us to make sense of a large quantity of data, to understand from 10,000 feet up why a problem is actually occurring, but also then to use technology to enable us to engage with citizens like most of these examples refer to, to be able to coordinate networks of people and to get the thousand foot view or the the worm's eye view rather than the bird's eye view of why a problem is actually impact, is happening and how citizens actually experience it. And then to be able to develop the skills of what we might call evidence synthesis or rapid evidence review, or I sometimes call it fast field scanning. How do I look out there for what else has already worked in other communities and bring that to my own community? So there's a set of skills and I outlined seven of them in the book and explain how people have used them both inside government and outside as what we might call social innovators outside of government or public entrepreneurs inside government, how people are leveraging these skills to be able to solve problems in new and exciting ways and wanting to do more to your point than simply describe something and leave it at that. The book also includes how to's. So how do you apply these skills to your own work and we provide worksheets for how to do that and a free course which we which complements the book that's available at solvingpublicproblems.org and where we now gratefully have uh, participants from 80 countries learning with us how to advance their mission driven work. So let me wrap up here with a uh, with a quick reflection which is that there is today really no defined field that we could call public problem solving. There are countless people working on social change and social impact inside government and outside. I'm sitting at the moment at Northeastern University coming from a two hour discussion with a room full of those people doing engaged community led social impact work. But outside of law schools where we talk about public interest law, we don't in universities have a field called social change or social impact. For a generation now, universities have invested in teaching people entrepreneurship, how to start a business. And I'm really excited about the fact that we're now on the cusp of really being able to take some of these skills and to build this field of social impact and really develop a field of study, a field of education and a field of knowledge. And I'm thrilled to also uh, report that thanks to the generosity of the Burns family, we're able to start a new center called the Center, the Burns Family Center for Social Change and Social Impact, 
that will be able to crystallize some of these lessons and help to bring these learnings, hopefully to more people, to be able to inspire more social change in our communities. So let me stop with that and get to the comments and questions. And well, that, that's great. So, so, I mean, I guess where I wanna start, uh, Beth, is by really asking you to dig into this um, idea about how we define a public problem. Um, and, and one of the things that's so striking about reading your book for someone who doesn't spend a lot of their time in the, in the kind of policy making world or in the social change world is that there, the kind of depth and precision uh, with which the people and institutions you're interested in are, are, are defining problems is, is just very different than the kind of general conversation. So like if, if you were to tune into a, a news television program, it seems as if the kind of core problems that we have to deal with in the world are things like uh, you know, climate change or government corruption uh, you know, or uh, you know, people complain that uh, we're, we're losing our fundamental freedoms because of government overreach, or they complain that uh, there's authoritarianism that's crushing democracy. Like we, we talk about problems at that scale. And it seems to me like in your book, you're not really talking about problems that way. You're, you're breaking them down and trying to, uh, push us to think about things more narrowly, uh, to, 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 to redefine issues so that we can get more traction on them one by one. And I, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just this whole issue of problem definition and how important it is uh, you know, to, to pause a little bit. Absolutely. Um, so first, uh, um, I, I have to confess that when we talk about the, we, we named the book Solving Public Problems. We talk about solving public problems, but I see from the discussion here that John C. Lee Brown is here and he will not remember that probably 10 years ago, he said to me, kid, you can't ever solve a public problem. As soon as you try to solve it, it morphs, it changes. We can tackle it, but we can't solve it. And so there is a way in which the kinds of problems you're talking to, the kinds of really enormous challenges from climate change to racial injustice, to economic inequality, um, to the political partisanship that bedevils us, these challenges are so massive that they partly lead to the kind of despair, the kind of shoulder shrugging and giving up. How can I make a difference that so many of us are familiar with? which is why there's a real discipline, an art, if you will, or, or even a science to the concept of problem definition. Uh, there's a wonderful Russian um, writer uh, who, who wrote a book called, uh, oh, well, it's now I'm blanking on the name of the book. Uh, it was the methodology was called TRIZ. That stands an acronym for something in Russian that I definitely can't remember at five o'clock. Um, uh, this is what the chat. This is what the chat function is for. So we could, we, you know, is, is to help me crowdsource to, this. But, my but. own. Anybody who's read the book knows it's the first thing you've ever heard me talk about. It. I talk about him all the time. He said, you know, there's a science of problem solving. Uh, Stalin didn't like that, and they they sent him to Siberia for suggesting we don't teach enough problem solving. So luckily, I hopefully will not get sent to Siberia. But I agree that we don't teach enough problem solving. And we need to teach what it means to define these kinds of really naughty problems. Some people might call them wicked problems. You might call them policy or societal problems. And it's one of the big gaps in both how we govern and in how we educate people. So in governance in particular, we reward people for coming up with solutions. We want them to come up with answers. But you know, the result of which when you start with the solution in our last iteration of this Future of Democracy Working Group, we had the writers uh, from Stanford who have a new book out called System Failure. And they talk about what happens at Stanford when you do that, you get a bunch of apps littering the floor that are solutions to problems that nobody has. So what do we do? We need to take the time to actually develop a discipline for learning how to use both data and community wisdom or public engagement, whatever name you wanna give it, but the perspective of the people experiencing the problem, as well as data, that bird's eye view and that worm's eye view, to bring them together to really understand the problem so that we can define it more narrowly 
in a way that actually then allows us to come up with solutions. You know, all if you're a professor or a teacher participating, we all know about the students who say, I'm going to solve climate change by Christmas. Um, and so this is about a process of going from the much bigger challenge to what I would call a narrower, more actionable problem with data back of it, with citizen perspective back of it that allows us to really take action. And that's a large part of what we do as a practical matter is we train people in how to define problems. So a quick last example here so that you can get to some of your other questions. We are doing a project with the city of Oakland now focused on allowing residents and enabling residents uh, a, a, a faculty and students at Mills College and the city to be able to come up with solutions to hard urban challenges together. We will not get anywhere unless we first sit down with the city and its residents to really define how do people really experience issues like uh, illegal dumping, abandoned autos and homelessness. How do they experience that in practice? It's only by doing that hard work that we will actually be able to develop solutions that work. So let me stop with that and uh, get well, your- so, so I, I mean, I, I just wanna stay on this thread a little bit um, because at first it sounds very simple, you know, take a big problem, you know, a big issue, break it down into constituent parts, you know, find a narrow thing that you can focus on and, and figure out a way to address it. And, you know, I know that you, you know, you, you said you were extensively involved with the state of New Jersey, thinking about its COVID response. You know, you worked in the Obama administration, you worked at 10 Downing, like you, you, you've been in, in, the, in these messes, you know, actually dealing with um, you know, urgent issues breaking in real time. And to, to go back to New Jersey, you know, not long ago, one would think that like the global COVID pandemic would be too big a thing to try to solve in, you know, its entirety. Uh, but that maybe a, a smaller piece of it that would be pragmatic would be like in, if we're in a moment in an in a infectious disease situation where you don't have medicine, you don't have a vaccine, a simple thing to do is to encourage people to wear masks, um, you know, to, uh, you know, as a simple measure for your respect to, for other people, concern about other people's health. Um, you know, that seems like we, we could push that. Um, that turned out to be just tremendously complicated, right? Like getting, getting people to wear masks. And I wonder like if we're in your problem defining mode and problem solving mode, how, how would you help us to think about that, that whole morass, Absolutely. mask wearing? So, as we know, a problem like mask wearing has very different, why people don't wear masks has very different root causes. You're the sociologist, so you can tell us better what those root causes are. But obviously, if the, if the root cause is disinformation and misinformation, it's a very different set of solutions than if the root cause is lack of access to masks or can't afford masks. Um, so just that process of being able to identify what is really the root cause of the problem is, is it, it is simplistic in many ways. But it's actually very, very hard to do in practice because we don't have the time, we don't have the energy, we don't have the kind of environment that affords us the opportunity to spend the time doing that. So if we have to race towards a solution, if we have to have the answer, if we are taught you know, that being the expert means having the answers to things, it can be very difficult to pause to open up, to listen, and to have the humility to say, I may not understand the problem. Apropos of, hum of listening, uh, I apologize. I understand the chat is disabled. So if we can oh. do anything about that while we are here, I don't think we can midstream. Uh, so please use the Q&A and we will see it. And if you want to, or you can use Twitter and uh, complain. It's there, so I'm sorry that the chat is disabled. I'm hearing no, 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 no complaining on Twitter, please. We're, we're, we can use Q and A. That's better. Uh, um, no, no anybody, who, anybody who knows who knows me knows that uh, transparency and collaboration are my hallmark. So I, I am, I apologize for that. That is an oversight. We'll try to fix it if we can. Um, Wait, so, so, the, so, the, I, I don't know if you're finished with the with the answer. Is that? Did you want to stop there? 
Um, so I think the point is uh, the point is that it's the idea is simple, but the practice is very, very difficult. And believe me, when we have surveyed people across multiple countries now, and we're expanding our four country survey into a seven country survey um, uh, of public servants to understand whether people use the skill of problem definition. And once they, um, once they uh, learn it, whether they then use it in their work. And the answer is very few people actually use it. And when they learn how to do it, then they use it all the time. That's the shorthand answer to that. So, 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 so one of the elements of um, this problem definition process is more participatory work on the part of you know, policymakers or powerful institutions. Is that, am I getting you right on that? Like be more actively involved in listening to the things your constituents are telling you, you know, what people understand based on their own ground level knowledge from where they live, is that the idea? That is part of the idea, but that has to be combined also with uses of data that give us a, a different perspective on the problem as well. So it's the combination of the, of the two that I think gives us the most well-rounded understanding of the problem to enable us to come up with solutions that will be responsive to the problem. Or as you have pointed out in your work, and I, you may mention that, um, it allows us to get a different perspective on why the problem is actually happening and to open up our imagination to completely new ideas. I think that's right. I, th I mean, what, what, what's, tr what's hard, I think, I'm just trying to think through this with you, is uh, the grounded experiences are so varied now and the sources of information are so varied and if we're talking about solving public problems in a contemporary world where there's this thing called the internet and misinformation is to be taken for granted uh, and um, a, a lot of our media is ideological, um, it, it, it seems as if it's going to get messy once you're down there and it will be hard to figure out um, what, you know, what the lesson is. So like, for instance, I think about, um, you know, if we wanna understand how to deal with how to increase vaccination rates, um, and we want to go to Florida and Texas and Georgia um, and, and and learn what's happening on the ground. Uh, I have a hard time knowing what we do with that information, and I wonder if you have thoughts about how about that. I think this is why uh, it's so important to have a set of methods and tools and approaches. Uh, it's not a free for all because uh, done wrong, uh, you can end up, and, and by the way, we don't have a huge amount of learning and evidence about all the, what is the right way to do this all the time. Uh, done wrong, you can open up, uh, you either create echo chambers, you create shouting matches, you create you know, dialogue that is anything but civic, um, you create more opportunities for people to manipulate the discussion. So really developing our learning, and that's where a lot of research is needed in how to do that, how to use tools to help us do that effectively, uh, is extremely important, number one. I think number two, though, the relentless focus on defining the problem and focusing people on a problem really helps, though, to avoid some of those challenges. So in other words, when, you know, our colleague Clay Shirky uh, you likes to say, and you can agree or disagree with this, there isn't a Democratic or Republican way of taking out the trash. He said this long before Donald Trump and COVID. Uh, this, is a, this is an earlier statement. So I think he might take this back now in some way. There may be a Democratic and a Republican way of taking out the trash these days. But that said, when we can channel our attention to solving a problem, that is reducing the amount of trash from X to Y, increasing literacy from A to B, doing the following, that really helps us to escape some of the most egregious challenges of partisanship um, by focusing us on a process for problem definition and then creating measurable solutions to the problem as defined. But coming back to your earlier question, a public problem and how we define it is precisely a problem that is going to be politically contested, that is in a, that exists in a fraught environment where we don't ha even have agreement that there is a problem, let alone what its root causes are. So this is not, again, simple in concept, very difficult in the execution, lots of need for learning, 
but we have some pretty good ideas now and experience about what works and how to apply it that can get us started. So, you know, you've invoked this idea that, that you know, we're going to use multiple forms of evidence. We're interested in different kinds of data so that, you know, what people think and experience on the ground is part of our data package, but so too uh, is the kind of computational data that we're awash in now and that we're just learning how to make sense of for you know, policymaking. We're just learning how to interpret it and analyze it as social scientists. And we're obviously, we're obviously gonna get much better at it. Um, could, would you mind describing uh, a, a kind of a, a case where uh, you know, bringing in computational data really helped you see a problem differently? Sure. Um, so let me give, we have the, the I, and I think there are lots of people here who can share some of their experiences. Um, it, some of the most successful examples really are, again, people who have done both. So it's people like the I team or innovation team in the city of New Orleans, which wanted to bring down the murder rate in New Orleans, which you know more about than I do, is has one of and has for a long time had one of the highest murder rates among cities uh, across America. And so I think what made their work successful and made them able to reduce the homicide rate by 25% in the first year and, a, and, and every year thereafter with a bump during COVID that, that many of us saw in cities across America um, was the fact that they combined both. They looked at data about recidivism, about crime, about unemployment, about education. They looked at it by neighborhood. They tried to understand where those hotspots are, but they didn't rely only on looking at the data they, in, in addition, also talked to people affected. That included people who uh, both were victims of crime, but also the incarcerated, the formerly incarcerated and their families to get a really holistic view on the situation and enable them both, number one, to define the problem, but also then to develop targeted responses and solutions. Um, so, you know, a completely different example, coming back to New Jersey during COVID, we worked with the Economic Development Authority there to look at data on job loss, on economic development, on disparities of COVID impact. But then we also talked to businesses about what are their needs, how are they experiencing the problem, and then turned around and developed a set of policy responses, grant programs, financing mechanisms um, that I think because of that interplay of both data and engagement, allowed New Jersey to be the third most successful state in terms of helping the business community. So after California and New York, much, much bigger states. And you could say, look, it's just because you gave away money. And so of course that was helpful, but I think that ability to be so responsive um, and to target the design of the policy uh, and services to what the needs are, I think is extraordinarily important. Last thing here, which is partly by way of a plug, which is not a problem we've solved yet, but a problem we need to solve. Growing out of some work we've been doing, um, I've served as the chair of the Future of Work Commission for the state. We have $10 million to spend in the next year on designing lifelong learning accounts. So we can talk to people about their uh, needs for upskilling, about the impediments to upskilling, about what would cause them to go out and get training. But unless we actually look at the data at the same time and take a computational perspective to understand what are the highest, gro highest growth job sectors, who are the, what are the highest uh, growth job sectors in the state? What are the training programs that exist to which people have access? What are the costs of those training programs? We need to be able to look at data sets at the same time as we talk to people, and then we can design solutions and mechanisms that are really responsive. And the same thing is true whether you're developing a national policy program uh, or whether you're frankly developing an app as an individual working in a community. That little bit of data plus engagement, I think can really help us to go a long way. And if you don't know how to do it for yourself, there are phenomenal resources out there of people who are willing to help and provide that kind of data science expertise. Nice. You know, there's another thing you, you know, write about. I'm obviously very sympathetic uh, to this idea, but I think flows naturally from what you're discussing now. And that is one of your recommendations is that in the problem solving mode, um, we 
take advantage of what the what these things you call positive deviant cases or you know po idea of the, the when you have positive deviance, you can learn something about, you know, solving a problem um, that you might not see if you're more focused on, you know, criticism, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's striking to me as a social scientist that, you know, we're often very good at, you know, taking things apart and showing why things don't work. Um, you know, we, te we tend to be focused on the critical side. Uh, and, and yet, there are a lot of things that work better than you would expect them to, and we can learn from studying them. And, and, I, and I wonder if you can talk about how, you know, how you see positive deviance uh, playing a role in problem solving. There are a number of techniques that people have developed for doing this work of better defining the problem. Uh, and so positive deviance, and Eric, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, whether it was the Sternins, Monique and Jerry Sternin, development professionals in uh, um, working for children's aid in Vietnam who developed the term, uh, um, but they were surely so among some of its noted practitioners who essentially asked the question, how do we turn the problem on its head, not by looking at what's failing, but looking at what's working as a way of defining the problem. So in Vietnam, they looked at poverty and hunger among children in rural villages in Vietnam. And instead of studying as many development professionals do, you know, let's look at the hungry children and see what kind of aid we can give them. They looked at the similar kinds of communities uh, and asked why in certain communities were children not uh, uh, suffering malnutrition. And that allowed them to understand what was going on in terms of the feeding habits of parents that really changed their perspective. Eric Schatt, mathematician at Mount Sinai Hospital, uh, does positive deviance um, in terms of disease research. He's not a geneticist, he's a mathematician. And he uses large scale data to troll through huge amounts of data to find people who have two recessive genes but who don't manifest a condition. And then to look at you know, the 10 people who have the two recessive genes, but who don't have the condition as a way of trying to better understand the problem and the pathways to disease. And maybe Eric, you would say a word about um, your own work with regard to Chicago and heat waves uh, um, uh, as it comes to positive deviance. Well, I, I want to keep the focus on your book, but all right, you're cheating. Eric has done really pathbreaking work in in this, and I, I write about his work in the book, um, which is to look at why do some people, for example, in a heat wave or in a natural disaster like Katrina, why do some people fare better than others? So that technique of turning the problem on its head, the technique of getting people from different disciplinary perspectives to look at a problem, the famous anecdote of the slow elevator, the idea of getting the psychologist to look at the problem of the slow elevator instead of the engineer, is what reveals then the solution that instead of the million dollar new engine and new elevator, it's the $5 mirror or Muzak or quiz system in the elevator um, that can be the solution to the problem. So there are techniques out there um, there are tools, there are, you know, heuristics that can be applied. And what I try to do is to bring some of them together into a curriculum that's designed really to help people advance their project from idea to implementation. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're talking about a curriculum because I, I want to talk to you about your work in the university world. You know, you, you, you worked in government and, you know, you've been at NYU for a while and now you're at Northeastern, uh, you know, building programs that teach differently. And I mean, I, I guess I need to ask you to say something about the concept of a do tank. Do tank. I keep saying that wrong. A do tank, uh, and you know, also what you think its role is in the teaching of people who are going to be involved in in policy or social change. Um, is this kind of thing on the curriculum right now? I mean, we, you know, it's, it strikes me that um, the kinds of courses you're teaching could easily be part of a public policy school. They could easily be part of a law school. You could be part of a social work school. I'm not as sure how it fits into social science, um, you know, but clearly there's a lot of social science work that goes into problem defining and, and, and problem solving. I can't tell you how many times I have students who come to me, even doctoral students, you know, and they, they wanna 
they want to work on something, but what they tell me they want to work on is like a, a vague fuzzy problem, like an issue. And, and the challenge for them is to, is to, you know, come up with a researchable question, right? That's, that's basically the, the analog uh, to, to your public problem to defi define properly. It needs to be like a researchable question that you can actually advance. So could you talk to me a little bit about, you know, your thoughts, of, your thoughts on the way that we're teaching students to do social change and to solve problems now in universities, and then what, what you'd like to do, um, you know, whether it's GovLab or, uh, you know, your, your new center? So the, I think we're not doing enough in universities. I think we have, as I alluded to before, made a generation long investment, not a bad one, a good thing to teach people how to start businesses. We want to teach students to become the next, you know, Mark Zuckerberg. Um, but I think that students, especially now, are demanding that instead of learning to move fast and break things, we want to learn how to move fast and fix things. And that's what we have not been doing enough of. You're right, there are surely pockets of it, but there are a few challenges. One is this needs to cut across disciplines because as we know, problems are complex, they're interdependent, and we're not gonna solve them by working in a policy school alone or in a law school alone or in design or engineering by themselves. We need to bring these fields together as some places are beginning to do, number one. Number two, too often, problems, the way we tackle them in universities are as pre-packaged case studies. They are problems as already defined by somebody else. It's a project handed to you by an organization that you work on. Um, so there's a great desire among students for more real world engaged work and social impact work, but that requires learning truly how to de define the problem. And third and lastly, we have done a lot in universities to focus on especially uh, uh, design as a discipline as it has kind of infected many other fields to focus on allowing people to come up with good ideas. But what we don't teach students is how to implement those good ideas. And so by itself, invention you know, is not innovation. We have to actually teach people how to implement their ideas in the world. And that requires having an, an understanding of institutions, of power, of budgets. And that's really a missing piece. So even when we're teaching people design or design thinking um, or to come up with inventions in the engineering disciplines, we're not teaching them about institutions. So it's really trying to bring together and create a more holistic curriculum that cuts across disciplines. And I will put in a little plug here in the chat is we're trying to, um, for a new position that's open, to actually try to recruit uh, a, a group of faculty who are interested in developing both curriculum re and research, um, but to promote this idea of the teaching of social change across disciplines. So let me stop with that. I could say obviously a lot more, but uh, we want to hear what others have to say too. Okay, well, speaking of uh, what others have to say, we have a lot of others saying things uh, on the Q&A and on the chat. Let me ask you, um, uh, everyone, we still, there's still, uh, basically nobody has left our conversation after 45 minutes, Beth. So that's, uh, that's, that's them. you're keeping them here. And um, uh, they're not here for the cheese cubes, it seems. They're definitely not here for the cheese cubes or the mediocre oh. red wine, but um, uh, unless you, unless you have some at home. So it, some of you have uh, put questions in the chat, which seems to be on again and off again. Would you mind uh, if you want it answered? Uh, putting it in the Q&A uh, function down on, uh, at, at the bottom of your screen. I can't wait until we can do this in person again, but we're here for now. So a few questions. Um, uh, one is we have a question from David Fleming uh, who asks, if you see a viable, or viable intersections or collaborative opportunities between open source government solutions and blockchain, provided that it's a sustainable, but it's not, technology. And if so, what, what advantages are there? Also, what challenges exist? And my apologies for the snide remark about blockchain. Maybe someone solved this problem. I, I think, I think uh, David's parenthetical about provided it's sustainable um, reflects the same concern yeah. about the environmental impacts of blockchain that we worry about. Yeah. Um, but I think David articulates really a broader class of question, which is also what's the role of technology more generally in all of this? And I think that's an important part of thinking about a curriculum for social change and social impact today, um, as opposed to 10 years ago or 20 years ago, is we have phenomenal tools 
that are available to us. Um, whether it's big data, whether it's machine learning, whether it's the technologies of collective intelligence, in other words, the technologies that allow us to have conversations and collaboration with people across a distance, whether it's blockchain that allows us to have, uh, in which blockchain does many, many things, including secure record keeping fundamentally and secure ways of, uh, and anonymized ways of sharing information, um, as well as a profusion of open source technologies uh, and the ability to, you know, change these tools to adapt them for civic purposes. I think that's what makes this conversation so exciting right now. Obviously, there are lots of challenges with regard to ethical and responsible uses of these technologies. Um, as you know, the Academy is awash in criticism about algorithmic bias the dangers of machine learning, you know, the failures to use technology in ways that um, respect equity and diversity uh, and sustainability. And that's why I think having a social change and social impact focus is so important for how we approach and a democratic focus is so important for our conversations about technology more broadly, which is to ask ourselves, how are we using technologies to allow us to advance social justice and to solve problems in the world, rather than having the floor be littered with the apps that nobody wants. Um, so blockchain, very much a part of this, and, and I will just put in the chat, or maybe Sam will, some work that the GovLab has done um, that you can find at blockchange.ge. Uh, um, which are case studies on uses of blockchain for social good and for governance that say a lot more than I have time to say right now. Do, do you worry at all that this uh, kind of use of data and the kind of interest in integrating new technologies for social change projects, is there a kind of a risk of making this kind of world of social change like um, um, I don't know, a more elite one, a technocratic elite world, one that's exclusive that, you know, where kind of the traditional grassroots act, social change actors are interpreted or treated like second class citizens, like they don't really know what the knowledge, what, what real knowledge is. How do you, how do you deal with that kind of concern? Oops, sorry, I'm, I'm responding to questions and responding to your question at the same time. Turns out I'm not, <laughs> I'm not as good at multitasking as I think. That's a tough multitask. <laughs> Let me not type and talk and I, I, I'm, ask me that one more time, the last it's the part. <laughs> it's the listening part that's hard. No, just, you know, in this discussion reading your book, I was struck by the relatively high bar for entry for some of these, you know, processes like one really needs to understand technology one needs some technical training you know we're talking about doing forms of data analysis that are hard for most people to do you know blockchain you know i think about a lot of people have no idea what you're talking about when you talk about using blockchain so i i just wonder whether um this way of talking about problem solving and problem defining carries with it a risk uh of of being exclusive uh, and of making other ways of defining and solving problems feel like they are second rate. Yeah. So first of all, none of these, none of these methods rely on technology exclusively. And much of what I write about, whenever I write about a high tech example, I write about very low tech examples. Um, you know, I, we, you talked, asked it before about using data. There's a wonderful group in Rajasthan called MKSS which does the work of reading government budgets out loud in the town square as a form of storytelling. So they're reading data as stories in order to get people to point out bridges built to nowhere and dead people on the payroll and whatnot. You don't need to have sophisticated machine learning to be able to leverage data and insights. Most of what I'm talking about is how do you have conversations with people? And we rely a lot on learnings from the social sciences. We didn't talk here about behavioral insights and about social scientific insights and the role that they play. We didn't talk about evidence-based learning and policymaking. That's a big, those are all big parts of the book. Um, but that said, there are tools, many of which are open source, are free and easy to use, which are making things like engaging with citizens easier to do and cheaper. In order to provide people with a baseline understanding of those tools in the way that we teach it, we do provide some introduction to digital skills. So in the 
version of solving public problems that we do with people in government, again, all free, all open, we teach digital basics, including explaining what blockchain is, including explaining what big data is, including answering, you know, um, those questions that people uh, are, are embarrassed to ask because they feel like they should know what blockchain is or they should know what big data are. Um, so we try to answer those questions and discuss how they apply to problem solving so that people come in with at least enough understanding to understand how tools could be useful to them. But tools are not a prerequisite and technology is not a prerequisite to doing Great. any of this work. Here, here's a question that's also about engagement. It comes from Tracy Russ. And I can't read it all, but Tracy says, we have reasonable evidence that focusing on a singular issue through social and civic mechanisms can yield positive outcomes. How do we more permanently include these capacities as ongoing civic capacities over one-off success stories and or, or learning failures? She says, it feels sometimes as, as if we build great civic festivals, then the tents get packed up and put away or forgotten when we really need more permanent public squares that stay vital in the life of communities and people as expectations for their participation? So it's a wonderful question, which I won't do justice to, but it's why we do a lot of our work with cities and with institutions and on research focused on how to institutionalize these practices so that they are not one-offs. So they're not what's sometimes called democracy theater. So um, we have a wonderful uh, uh, woman who used to be at the GovLab, who um, was a former student of uh, mine uh, um, uh, named Dinora Kantu, who went off to become the head of public innovation and public engagement in San Pedro in Mexico. And so together with Dinora, we did a project called the City Challenge. I just put an example of that in the chat, another an example from Africa, Sam will put the one from Mexico. Um, but we started this project of co-designing urban solutions with residents with her. And what was so exciting about that project was not that we did a competition and get citizens to come up with ideas and then did a bunch of projects. It's that the city then repeated it and repeated it and then legislated the use of citizen engagement as the way that they make policy in that city. Um, it's why we did a set of case studies together with Nesta, looking at examples of cities all around the world who are engaging with residents and how they institutionalize those practices, really trying to look at what are the ingredients for going from pilot to really regular practice of co-design, collaboration, and participation as a way of solving problems. Um, and also we talked to uh, 12 different organizations that have been regularly leveraging engagement as a way to solve problems and put up another free course at covidcourse.thegovlab.org. Um, those range from Reboot to Nesta to Ushahidi and Federation of American Scientists and to really understand the mechanics of how people are doing this kind of problem solving in practice so that we can communicate those lessons learned. Beth, we have five minutes and a bunch of questions. So I'm gonna read them to you and you speak as, respond as long as you want, but the longer we go, the fewer questions we'll get to. Here's one from Gerard Ralphs, who's listening from South Africa. Uh, he works in a public research council that's mandated to produce social science research to address country's big challenges, poverty, inequality, unemployment, et cetera. Gerard says, our organizational culture tends to be highly bureaucratic and risk averse with only niches of innovative activity. Capacities to work with large data sets is limited. How do organizations responsible for coming up with ideas for solutions start to promote the kinds of approaches that you're advocating here? Training, training, and training. So it's, we cannot assume that these are innate skills, learning how to use data, learning how to listen to citizens. These are learned skills. You don't have to become a data scientist. You can develop a capacity for understanding the value of data and then how to reach out to other people for using data and working with data. So I'm now investing a lot of my time and efforts, again, in curriculum building and in education. Um, it's why I'm so excited about this new Burn Center that we will be launching to really try to spread this curriculum. Uh, and we're having conversations both with governments around the world and with social innovators on trying to spread the learning of these skills. So Steve Buckley uh, wants to hear you say more about listening, e experts learning to listen. 
He's got a pointed question about whether anyone in Obama's open government program understood how important it was to listen. Uh, but I think the more general point is, you know, less about a specific, you know, specific administration here or there. Uh, we could think about all kinds of administrations that, you know, listened or didn't listen. But like, how do how do we think about that problem? I mean, especially it seems to me at a moment when distrust is very high and, you know, partisanship is fierce. Um, you know, that, that listening is, is a tougher skill than many of us in the academy recognize. Listening is a really, really tough skill. I know Lorelai Kelly is here, so I would ask her to put a link in the chat if she hasn't already to some of her work uh, about how she is getting members of Congress to listen in new ways uh, and organizing those processes again to make those practices efficient and effective. Um, you know, when I first went into government, someone said to me, never assume malevolence where incompetence will do. And by that expression, what they meant was, you know, don't underestimate the fact that people just don't know how to do this. Yes, there are plenty of badly intentioned people who don't want to listen, but there are lots of people who would listen if they understood how to do it and to do it efficiently and to do it effectively in a way that actually leads to real outcomes. And so that's where research and learning are necessary. Um, there have been great advances in how to do that. Tomorrow, I'm going to go talk at the MIT Computational Social Science Group to ask people smarter than me how they are using machine learning to enable that kind of listening now in new ways. Um, so we already have, again, advances in the social sciences for many years that have helped us to learn how to organize dialogue, how to organize deliberation. Sociologists go out into the field all the time um, with effective ways of managing conversations with people and technology is giving us new ways of doing that. Um, so it doesn't help to solve the problem of political will, but there are many people, especially public servants more than politicians um, who are eager to listen if they have the skills and the methods for how to do that. I'll tell you, I, I teach a course on the sociology of climate change and one of my favorite assignments, it's always the student's favorite assignment is about six weeks into the course when their blood's really boiling and they're getting anxious and they feel like they you know, know the problem and also how to solve it, I asked them to find a climate change skeptic uh, who's in their social network and to have a conversation with them, you know, not, to, not to judge, not to debate or argue, but just to try to hear what they're saying and understand what's what's on their minds, and you know you could do a comparable assignment for an individual on something like back the vaccine issue, um, you know, and uh, it, it's always very challenging, but it's also very useful. And it seems to me like you know even before we get to the the kind of bigger question about how officials learn to listen um, uh, to a diverse set of views, getting our students to learn how to listen to one person uh, who has a, something different to say. Uh, is, is an important challenge. We have time for one more question and it's gotta be a simple one uh, or one, you know, a short one, I should say. So I'm gonna go to uh, Jacques Courbe uh, and, and the question is, are there some successful examples of tools that governments can use to engage and collect information from citizens? And I presume, you know, the meaning is not like surveillance, uh, uh, but, you know, are, are there, you know, tools that you especially like for kind of getting more participation? Yes, and this gets to Arnaud's question in the chat also about liquid democracy and new yeah. kinds of tools, again, for engaging with and listening to citizens. I think the important thing here is to recognize that there are different courses for different courses, as the expression goes. If you're looking to define problems with citizens, there are wonderful tools like uh, your sociologist colleague, Matt Salganik at um, Princeton has developed a free and open source tool um, that Sam will again put in the chat for me um, uh, that, uh, um, uh, 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 that, that is uh, used, it's wonderful for getting people to define a problem. If you wanna get people to come up with solutions, there's a wonderful free and open source tool from Iceland called Your Priorities. We just used it in New Jersey and we heard from almost 20,000 people in two weeks um, that was wonderful for doing things at scale. There's great work being done by Deb Roy at MIT to use big data. He spoke about this also in our IP. This is like our best of IPK, Future of Democracy. So we've had all these people come and speak. 
Um, he spoke a few months ago about how he's using big data to actually analyze the sentiment and meaning of what citizens are doing. But again, different tool for solving a problem than there is for defining a problem. And in turn, wonderful examples of how to help get help with implementing solutions or evaluating. We have a lot of these up on a, a, a website called crowd.law and congress.crowd.law and other resources that Sam will put in the chat. Um, and I'm, if you're looking for pointers to specific platforms and tools, happy to make recommendations, but it's a lot of what we've been doing is experimenting with what are the tools, what are the platforms, how can we make this easier? Thanks, Beth. So I can't think of many um, conversations we've had at IPK where we start with, you know, 90 people and there's 80 people by the time we finish an hour later, especially when it's sunny, still and beautiful. Uh, in New York City. Now we have people here from South Africa and Brazil and Mexico uh, and many other places besides. So, uh, you know, may maybe there's nothing else to do and it's late at night in some spots. But I think, Beth, that you, you know, you've hit upon something that we all want to learn more about. And um, we told everyone that um, we would break at six o'clock and we're going to honor our, our promise to make this an hour long event. But uh, it is also a book launch event. Let me remind everyone of um, Beth's book here, Solving Public Problems. Like you could have this in your home right now as well. Um, and because we always like to do something kind of festive and celebratory, um, and you know, generally that's done, you know, with book signing. Um, I'm going to say that we're we're going to close the official part of this evening, and so I'm going to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, this has been a really terrific conversation. Uh, and Beth, I, I want to say especially thank you to you for writing such a thoughtful book um, and for um, uh, sharing with it, sharing your thoughts about it with us tonight. It's really great to have you here and um, we wish you a terrific launch. Um, so and thanks to everyone for being here as well. Uh, and uh, 